All right, let's take our Bibles and go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy 3, and look with me at verse number 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, from, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture tonight. And Father, as we prepare to look at this particular passage this evening, that uh, you would give us your help. Lord, help us to have understanding and rightly divide the word of truth tonight. Lord, I pray that you would have us glean the truths tonight from this passage that you would want us to have here on January the 9th, 2019. Minister to us as only you can, and Holy Spirit be our teacher. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, and uh, he is saying that uh, no, also notice in the last days perilous times will come and it's interesting how you can pick up from Bible writers that they even believed that they were in the last days look at a couple of scriptures with me will you uh, turn to your right in your Bible uh, go past Titus and Philemon and you'll find the book of Hebrews notice Hebrews 1 and verse number one says, God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these, what church? Last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the world. Keep looking. Go past Hebrews now to your right. And you have James and go past James to First Peter and then go to Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. And again, Peter writing this epistle, and he again writing it to uh, the believers, and he said in verse number 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of His coming? And etc., etc. Again, last days thinking that this, these are the last days they're referring to and they're living in right then. Keep going to your right to 1 John chapter 2. And notice what John says in 1 John 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Okay, and then of course Jude, right before the book of Revelation, Jude in verse number 18, Jude, Jude says how that they told you, well let's bring up verse 17, but beloved remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. And so we understand when we talk about the last days, I know uh, those of us who live in this, this time frame, you know, we say, oh, surely we're in the last days. And, uh, and, and I can tell you this with, with surety, we've been in the last days for quite a while now. And uh, according to the Word of God. And, and I remember, uh, you know, th those of us who were around, if you were saved in the, in the late 60s and in the 70s, uh, prophecy was really huge during that time and uh, surely uh, everyone thought that uh, we'd never see 2019 at least not on this earth and uh, that it would be over with by then because we thought we were in the last days and we were 
And we still are. And uh, because a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So God does not count time quite like we do. But notice what he says back in 2 Timothy chapter 3 again. He says, Timothy, I'm telling you something, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous means dangerous times are going to come. Hazardous times, full of risk. Literally, it means this, times that are hard to deal with. Hard to deal with times will come. Can I tell you that sin always brings hard to deal with times? The way of transgressors is hard. Okay? And, and so sin will always bring hard to deal with times. And those hard to deal with times are here. There's not, there, if, if you, there's got to be times. There is with me. When you hear certain things and you listen to the way some people talk and their reasoning, you just feel like, I think my head's going to explode. Uh, how can they think that way? How, can they, they, how come they can't understand uh, something that seems so basic and so right and they can't seem to see it? It's, uh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, right, right is left and left is right and up is down and down is up and everything is just turned upside down. And it's just unbelievable. It's a, this is going to catalog for us here some characteristics of what it's going to be like here in the last times. Now, he's writing it to Timothy. For Timothy to be prepared for this kind of thing, and certainly, if he had to be prepared for this, we would have to be prepared for this. And we can, just as sure as, I don't know what Timothy thought when he read this, whether he thought about, yeah, that's the day in where I'm living right now, but certainly you'll see this is the day in, where, in which we're living. All right, And so let's look at these characteristics of the last days. Number one, it says men will be lovers of their own selves. Self-love. In other words, please me before you please anybody else. Okay? And uh, we, uh, I'm number one. In fact, there for a while we called it the me generation. The me generation. What's in it for me? Self-interest over mankind's interest. Self-interest over our country's interest. And, and again, most of the sins you're going to see on this list and most of the behavior you're going to see in this list all stem from that very first one. A love of self. A love of self. Self is the old man. Self is the old nature. Self is old habits. Self is old ways. Self is that, is that sinful nature that all of us have. Somebody said, the, I never met a man who gave me as much trouble as myself. Okay? And most of you can say amen to that. Okay? No matter who you have trouble with, I don't care who you have difficulty with, the one you struggle the most with is the person you look at in the mirror every morning. Uh, self. Self. The, the, the self-absorption is the most fundamental problem at all. Selfishness. Now the secular society and the secular psychiatrist, they'll tell you your problem is you don't love yourself enough. You, you, you don't uh, care enough about yourself. No, that's not the, the, the difficulty. That, I mean, that's not the solution. That's the problem. The Bible says that preoccupation with self, a love of self, is... The problem. But salvation, as we know in the Bible, is not just something that gives us eternal life and takes us to heaven one day. Salvation is, listen, He'll call His name Jesus for He'll save His people from their sins. And He doesn't just save us from our sins. I believe He saves us from ourselves as well. There's victory over self in salvation. Not just victory over uh, uh, the penalty of sin. You know, a place full of selfish people is never considered heaven. It's probably closer to the other place. Selfishness. Looking out for number one. It's out of a love of self that people love money. People love money. Why? Because they can buy things for themselves. They can get more stuff. 
by comfort, by pleasure, by recognition, by power. That love of money is, is tied very closely to a love of self. What can I get? We see it in churches. People come to church and churches end up having to try to market themselves to people. Well, here's what we can offer you and here's what programs we have and this is what we have for this age group and this is what we have for that age group and this is what we do for this group over here. And, and then that church down the road says, oh, they offered you that? Well, we have coffee and donuts on Sunday. How about that? And, and we're offering these people all these things to try to market them. Why? Because what do you got for me? What do you got for me? What's in it for me? You see? And we've, we've got the wrong mentality. We don't come to church for what's in it for me. We come to say, can I serve God here? How can I, how can I do something for the Lord in this place? And, and, and not, not to focus on me, but to focus on God. You can see the, 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 the pride and the, the lovers of their own selves. Philippians reminds us, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. When we love ourselves, listen, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And so really, when I say I'm gonna, men are lovers of their own selves, what they're doing is they're pushing God out of there and they're putting themselves there. And they become the number one love of what they want. They become their own gods. And when people become their own gods, there is a moral collapse. And we see it in our country. People become lovers of themselves, not lovers of what is good, are lovers of God, and when that happens, society dissolves because there's no moral absolutes. There's no moral standard by which to go by. There's no restraints. Oh, you identify as this? Oh, okay. I can't tell you're wrong. Oh, you want to have a relationship with it? Well, I can't say you're wrong. You see, there's no moral absolutes. If you're, if you're, the, you're the God, Everyone just does what's right in their own eyes. And there's no moral restraint whatsoever. Much like the time before the flood. And, and woe be to anybody who tries to question those lifestyle choices. <laughs> and we find that the divorce becomes commonplace. Marriage gets redefined. Homosexuality isn't just tolerated, it's promoted. And you end up with a, with a mess. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, the next thing is covetous. And that goes with it as well. Covetousness is excessive, obsessive desire to have things. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, Beware of covetousness. Colossians 3, 5, Covetousness, which is idolatry. You go on in 2 Peter chapter 2. In fact, we're not far from there. Turn to your right to 2 Peter chapter 2, will you? This is in 2 Peter 2. Again, he's warning about false teachers. And again, he's in the context of believing we're in the last days. And he's given some context here to false teachers and preachers. And he says in 2 Peter 2 and verse 3, notice what he says. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words? What's feigned mean? What? Fake. Not genuine. Okay? Fake words. What are they going to do with their fake words? Make merchandise of you. It means they're going to tell you things to get you to send them money. Sometime when you think you're really enjoying somebody, just Google their name and see how much money they got. Boy, it's quiet. Hmm? Just think about what you're reading here and think about some of the modern day folks that are so popular in our country that are multi, multi, multi millionaires. Okay? With feign words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Slip down, if you will, to verse number 14. It says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling 
unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Boser, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam was in it, and you read his story in the Old Testament, he was in it for what he could get out of it. They wanted to pay him the money. He's willing to change the message for however he would get the money and be able to get, the, get paid for it. Now, that's, that's Peter is reminding us that's going to be characteristic of the last times and, and, and false prophets and false teachers in the last time. But overall, it's just a covetous attitude in the last times. And, and by the way, it's easy to fall into in America. We have more than anybody else in the world. We live with so much more than anyone else in the world. You know, we were, who was it? Uh, Ron was telling us about the fellow over in India. Feed a, feed a pastor and his family in India for $20 a month. Well, what is that? A sack of rice. That's, you know what that is? That's rice for breakfast. Rice for lunch and rice for dinner. If you if you <laughs> if your wife came out with the same thing about three nights in a row, I think some of you fellows will say, uh, what, "What what's going on here? <laughs> Can we get done with this? <laughs> I mean, is this? Uh, I think this will be the last time we cycle this through, won't it? Huh? That's that's America. Okay, that's Americans. And ask yourself, does money? Do possessions, do things control me? Or does God, His Word, and His Spirit control me? See, it all, it all comes back to that lovers of their own selves. Because why do I want money? Why do I want possessions? Why do I want these nice things? You know why? Because it makes me look good. And after all, it is about me looking good. Is that what it's about? Covetousness. Love his own selves, covetous. Then, this goes along with it, doesn't it? Boasters. What are boasters? Huh? Braggarts. Braggers. Bragging about what they're going to do. Back in the book of James, uh, chapter 4, it talks about this. When... Um, Get here to the book of James. In James 4, it says, Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city, continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Wow. Boasting about what we're going to do. Where we're going to go. What we're going to buy. And not always prefacing it with, if the Lord wills. If this is what God wants. God can change those plans anytime He wants. Because it's not, if they're not my possessions, it's not my money, it's all His. It belongs to Him. I'm a steward. Remember, we're stewards of what He's given to us. So He can change those plans anytime He wants. And He has the right to do so. So we don't boast about that. It's not, it's not what I say about myself, it's what God says about me that matters. Okay. In Corinthians, Paul reminded them, don't, don't you go comparing yourselves among yourselves and and you know, comparing yourself with one another. Don't do that. That's not the important thing. The important thing is what does God know about you? And what does God say about you? In fact, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 14, Paul said this, Galatians 6 and verse number 14, God forbid that I should glory, that I should boast, okay? Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. 
Paul said, I'm not going to glory in anything. I'm not going to boast about it. If I boast about anything, I'll boast about the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that, listen, the world is dead to me and I'm dead to the world. That means, you know, why don't you want to be around dead things very long? Oh, they start to stink, don't they? Okay? And so he says, I'm going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ because that's where I die daily. And you know what? By doing that, the world stinks to me. And guess what? I stink to the world. The world's dead to me and I'm dead to them. We have a mutual agreement. I don't like them and they don't like me. Okay? And that's a, they said, that's what I'll, I'll glory in. I'll boast in that. Because without Him, I'm nothing. Be careful. Be careful. You know, we, we try to always on Friday night with testimonies, you know, we, we stress in our you that we don't give a testimony to talk about ourselves or to, to, to make us look good. The testimony is to make God look good and to put the spotlight on God, not on us. And so, you know, but, but people get so self-centered. Instead of, you know, it, it'll still be. So what they learn to do, you know what they do? Well, I want to thank God that I got to do this. And I thank God I got to do this. And I did this. And thank God I did this. All they're doing is throwing two words in in front of I. Thank God. I. 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 But it's still all about me. Do you understand? Without Him, we can do nothing. Anything, anytime somebody tries to put something on you, you, you better deflect that to the Lord. And you better say, praise God. And by the way, that's just so you know, that's one of the reasons why we don't applaud. So why don't you clap in your church? Because you know what had happened? Because somebody would sing a song and say, well, they clapped louder for the other person Sunday than they did for me. And before you know it, it's a, it's, it's, hey, it's the flesh. And, and you'll think, well, I didn't get a good... Boy, you hear how loud they clap for me? Man, they must like me. I'm, I'm pretty good. I noticed when she played, they didn't clap for her very well. Of course, she's not as good as I am. See what happens? And just that quick, boy, pride snaps in. And, and we don't want that. You know what you do? And by the way, why are you singing? Why are you playing? Why are you playing? You're playing for the glory of God. So if somebody is blessed by it, give praise to God. That's who you're doing it for anyway. Aren't you? Okay. All right. Just checking. All right. Let's go to number four. We got a long way to go. We got to hurry, don't we? Yeah, that will be here for a while. Okay. We are lovers own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Proud. Proud is having a high opinion of yourself. A high opinion of your own importance and worth. We know from the book of Proverbs, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Through and through again, God hates seven things, six things the Lord hates, seven are abomination unto Him. Number one on the list, a proud look. See? A proud look. Don't you know who I am? Yeah, you're a sinner saved by grace. That's all we are. Okay? Don't, God resists the proud. Don't, don't allow pride to get into your life. Boy, put it down daily. The smaller we become, the more room God has to work. God never can fill anybody who's already full of themselves. Okay? Proud. Then it goes to blasphemers. Blasphemers are simply irreverence toward God and the things of God. To speak evil of the authority of God. It's, it's, think about it now. You're boasting of yourself to men and then you're blaspheming God. You have to. If you're the, you're the one you love, you're the one you want to brag about, you're the one who's got pride, you're the one you love, how can you put God in there? You've got to put God down. And they do. Then, then now, now think about this. Here we are. Love is our own selves. Covetous. 
boasters, proud, blasphemers. But then look at the next one. Disobedient to parents. How did that get in there? That sure seems out of place, doesn't it? I mean, these other things, yeah, they're, they're big. I mean, I just don't do what mom and dad say. That's no big deal. Oh, God must think it's a pretty big deal. God must think it's a pretty big deal. Because it's not just disobedient to parents. You find out it's disobedient to authority. And when you're disobedient to authority, it started in the home. It started because mom and dad, you didn't make them listen. You didn't make them mind. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. And, and yet we have parents today, well, no, I don't, I don't tell them what to do. I just give them choices. Well, that's not the Bible. How can they obey when you don't give them any commands to obey? Make your children obey. Make them know that when you speak... And listen, obeying isn't, isn't, I told you to do that, and they just look at you. Okay, one, two... What is that? Huh? It doesn't say children obey your parents before they count to three. Children obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. So you give them something to obey. You're not their buddy. You're not their friend. You're the parent. Okay? You're the parent. And this is what we do. And, and listen, I'm fine if you want to try to explain everything to your child, but the truth is there's sometimes... You know why they do it? Because you're the dad and you're the mom and you're, they're the child and they do what they're told. That's it. You're teaching them to obey authority. They have a lot, of, a lot of people, when they don't get their way, they want to riot and break windows and set fires and do all that junk. You know why? Because they threw temper tantrums at home and mom and dad didn't do anything about it. Amen, pastor. That's good. Teach them to work. Teach them to work. Clean your room. Take out the trash. Vacuum the room. Why? So you can live here. Because you eat at our table and we give you a bed to sleep in. See, not everything's just for money. They can have some jobs if you want to, but they ought to work. Nobody ought to get an allowance. Let's not start the entitlement program when they're little in our house. That I get paid just for breathing. Nobody gets something for just breathing. Okay? And uh, no, you want, you want something, you work for it, and you earn it, and you go buy it. That's how it works. And, and teach your children that. Well, I could get off on that a while. I better not. But see, it, it, goes, it goes back to number one. Why, why aren't parents training their children? Why aren't they teaching them these things? You know why? Because they're too in love with themselves. Parents are too wrapped up in their own stuff to realize they have kids to rear and children to bring up. They're too busy still playing their games and doing what they want to do. Listen, listen. Once you have children, it's not about you anymore. It's about them. And you need to say, I need to focus on them to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's my number one job. And I see to it that it gets done. And, and listen, that means mom and dad, you've, you have got to acknowledge God's authority in your life. Or why should your children acknowledge yours? If, if you don't acknowledge God's authorities in your life, it's going to tell you, well, I know the pastor, I know he said this, or I know the Bible says this, but you know what, We're, we don't do that here. Well, what are your children going to do when you tell them what to do? See, if you're not obeying your authorities, you're going to have, you only reap what you sow. If I want to reap obedience, I better sow obedience to my authorities. It goes both ways, mom and dad. We have... Disobedient to parents. Then we have unthankful. Unthankful. Someone said there's no worse name to describe a person than ungrateful. And boy, can we get that way. 
As much as we have, and we have more than 99% of the people in the world, and yet we complain as much as anybody in the world. Complain about the job, complain about taxes, complain about the weather, complain about bills to pay. When we have a full stomach and we have a roof over our head, we have clothes on our back, and we got more food in the cupboard if we want it. I think this gets into the entitlement mentality. And we're not grateful for what we have. And thankful for what we get. We get that, again, it comes back to I love myself, so I deserve this. Give me, give me, give me. As a prodigal son, you need, you need, give me. Come on, give me my money. Uh, give me what's mine. I deserve the help just because I'm me. And if I don't get help, I'm going to get mad and I'm going to kick and stomp and I'm going to throw a tantrum. And by the way, it's your fault, not mine. That's what happens. Can you imagine? Listen, can you imagine what would happen in our country if the federal government stopped giving out entitlement checks? What, would, what kind of riots would take place? I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at, first of all, we need to, we need to face reality at some point. We, we cannot sustain the level of entitlements that we're giving away now. Let alone, say, let anybody come into the country who wants to come in here, legal or illegal, and we will pay for everything. Where does that money come from? It can't be done. It will, it will completely bankrupt our country as we know it. And, and somebody's got to understand that. If, 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 if we had to pay our $20 trillion debt, how would that happen? We can't. And when people are not grateful, when they're unthankful, they will get violent when they don't get what they think they deserve. We've seen it already. It's happening. And it won't get better. It'll get worse. Just, just wait and see. And, and I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. But if our current president gets reelected in 2020, you'll have mass rioting in our streets. I hope I'm wrong, but it wouldn't surprise me. It's just amazing how unthankful our country has become. Ungrateful. What follows ungrateful? Unholy. Unholy. Unholy, as we talked about before, is unlike God. And by the way, unthankful and impure or unholy go together. And if I'm unthankful with my mouth, I'm going to be unholy with my mind and my body. And boy, do we live in a very unholy time. No respect for sacred things. There's no fear of God before their eyes. I don't know about you, this is amazing. Just how up to date the Bible is with the day in which we live. Then we go to number three. We're doing all right. With it, number three, without natural affection. Literally, literally, it means without heart. In other words, they're not going to have, parents are not going to have the natural affection for their children, and children aren't going to have the natural expression of, or, or affection for their parents. How does, how, does a, how does a parent kill their child? How, do, how does a child kill their mom and dad? But we've seen that happen. Multiple times. It's just, it's just uh, that, that, that boggles you. 
And by the way, it goes back to, how come I don't love them like I should and they don't love me? Because we're too busy loving ourselves. That's, that's what, face it folks, that's what fuels the abortion. Is I don't want this kid. Why? Because I can't live the way I want them. Messes me up. It's a, it's a lover of self rather than a love for that child. That's where we are. Without natural affection. And we can also talk about it's, it's natural for a man to be attracted to a woman and a woman to be attracted to a man. That's natural. Anything else is unnatural. Without natural affection. Then it says they're truce breakers. It means their word doesn't mean anything. We could, we could put that over the Congress of the United States. Word doesn't mean anything. They're held by no engagement. They're obliged by no oath. Persons who readily promise anything because they never intend to perform it anyway. Isn't that our politicians? You go back, you go back and you've seen the clips on television. Every president since Herbert Walker Bush has said that they're going to uh, bring about immigration reform. They're going to do something about the immigration thing. Now you've got a president who's not a politician, he's a businessman who's used to when he says he's going to do something, he does it. And the politicians are having a hissy fit over it. You're not supposed to actually do it. You're supposed to say you're going to do it. That's how politics works, but it's not how business works. Truce breakers, they don't care. That's where we are. Then it says false accusers. False accusers, literally slanderers. Now we think usually slanders just where you're talking lies about somebody else, but... Slander can also consist of the truth if the only reason you're telling it is to hurt somebody else. If I'm trying to harm the one I'm speaking of, in other words, the slander is one who just wants to ruin people's lives by what they say. And to be slanderous Hey, to be a to be an accuser of the brethren is like who? Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who likes to bring slander. So slander and this false accusation, these false accusations are devilish and demonic, they're satanic. Don't get in that crowd. Then it says incontinent. Incontinent. To understand this, it literally means that it's without strength. It's used, if you remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's talking about a husband and a wife. And it says, boy, there's so much here to talk about, but I, I, I'll try to, try to rein it in here. It says, let the, in verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. For the wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. In other words, you, listen, a husband and wife for their intimate relationship should not withhold that from one another. You don't ever hold that back from somebody because you're mad or you have an argument. God says that's not what you do. The only time you do that is by agreement. And it's for prayer and fasting. That's what He said. It have to be with consent for a time. Why? That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Why do you come together again? That Satan tempt you not for your in. Con- Continency, incontinency, okay? Incontinency, same word. And it is, it is a, a lack of strength or a un, unable to resist passions. 
So when, when we're incontinent, we don't resist any passions. Whatever we want to do, whatever the, the lust or the desire is, that's what we do. There's no restraint. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. That's what that incontinent means. There's no restraint. And we're there today too. Nobody has restraint. Not only in actions, but in words. If they want to say it, they just say it. And, and no matter who it hurts, no matter what, who, who it harms, or no matter what, it, what they say, they don't care. They just say it. Then it says fierce. Fierce. Ungentle. Harsh. Severe. It's the exact opposite of gentleness and mildness. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Remember earlier in 2 Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. There's no need to be harsh and severe. The next one is despisers of those that are good. Men, men that love themselves and don't have any kindness. Listen, they're not just, they don't just don't care for good men, they despise them. They, they hate them. As I, when I read that, I thought of Isaiah 53.3, that Jesus was despised and rejected of men. And there was never anyone better than Jesus Christ. Never anyone gooder. Bad English, but good communication. Here He was, the Son of God, and they despised and rejected Him. So listen, don't, you, you can't make it your goal as a Christian, well, I want everybody to like me. Well, then you're not going to be like Jesus. Okay? Don't make that your goal. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. If you're like me. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Then it says traitors. Obviously, someone who betrays, whether a friend or his country. In Luke 6 and verse 16, Judas was called the traitor because he betrayed Jesus Christ. And then the next one is heady and high-minded. Heady and high-minded. It really means you're rash. You're, you're, you're ready to do anything. It's, it's almost like falling forwards or you're prone or you're inclined. You're ready to do anything. In other words, people are ready to do anything without thinking it through first about what could happen. What are the consequences? They don't think about that. They just do it. And then it ends by saying you're, that they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And again, that goes all the way back to the first one. You're going to be a lover of pleasure because I love me most of all. So I just want pleasure. What I want. And when that happens... God says they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They'll have a veneer of religion. There's a lot of religion today. You heard me say the other day about how many, what they consider mega churches now in the United States. Hundreds compared to just dozens 20 years ago. And yet, where's the power of God? We have a lot of ones that talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. I was reading an article today in a Christian periodical that said the average evangelical Christian committed, they said the average committed evangelical Christian goes to church two times a month. That's Sunday morning only, two times a month. Well, boy, you're going to be a strong Christian that way, aren't you? They keep up appearances, but they just do what they want to do. But be careful. Don't fall into that category. Don't fall into the ones who just go to church and then they, they leave it in the auditorium and go live any way they want the rest of the week. 
live just as selfish as the unbeliever and just as self-centered as the unbeliever and slander and gossip and be unforgiving and vengeful. But then here you are back in church next Sunday. Oh, how I love Jesus. And then at lunch that day, well, I couldn't believe he did that. Man, I tell you what, I... And we're talking and gossiping and slandering. Are we singing those songs and we go home and turn on the television and watch things that we ought not to even look at? We talk the talk and we don't walk the walk. You know, Jesus Christ doesn't just forgive our sin and give us a ticket to heaven. He gives us victory over our sins and stubborn habits. We let not sin have dominion over you anymore. The reason that we're dominated by certain sins and stubborn habits is simple. We let them. And we don't have to. Because greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. If the Son will make you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed means free completely. Free from every stubborn habit and addiction that could plague you. How? By Jesus Christ. That's how. Let the Son make you free. Because you're not under the law. You're under grace. So those things ought not to characterize us. Alright? I'll try to skip through here so we can wrap it up. Three, three survival strategies, and we'll talk more about these next week. I'll just give them to you tonight, okay? Three survival strategies. Number one, follow godly leaders. He tells Timothy and about his life and, and that he you fully known my doctrine and manner of life and purpose and faith and long suffering and charity and patience and persecutions and afflictions and he, he talks about uh, you've known me. Paul told the church of Corinth, follow me as I follow Christ. It's good to have someone to follow, someone to look up to, someone to say I I'm going to follow them and walk in their footsteps. Find godly people and follow them. The world has... Listen, there's a lot of imposters and a lot of charlatans in the world. You have to know that. Find somebody who's real. And by the way, what's that mean for us? Be real. Be real so that somebody could follow you as you follow Christ. And they'll be on the right track. Alright? Number two, continue in what you've learned. That's what he told Timothy. Continue thou to things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. He's saying, stay on track. It's the, it's the Word of God that gives you confidence in a difficult day, in a difficult world. When people lose their confidence, I'll almost guarantee you they've gotten out of the Word of God. So listen to... Uh, continue in the way you've been taught. And then thirdly, let the Word of God make you complete. The man of God, when you get the Scripture in verse 16, the man of God will be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. We'll talk more about 16 and 17 next week about the Word of God. Well, two weeks. We'll have the uh, fennels here next Wednesday night. But... God tells us here in His Word what is right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. It's all in the Bible. And we've got to stay with the Word of God. And that's what, we, that's what we use. Here's John Wesley's quote. John Wesley said this, I am a creature of a day, passing through life, has an arrow through the air. I am a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over hovering over the great gulf, till a few moments hence, I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, 
How to land safe on that happy shore. God Himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end He came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. I like that. Let's be men and women of one book. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You for everyone's attention. And Lord, so, so much to cover in this particular passage. Thank You for everyone's attention this evening. And I pray, Lord, that though we are in perilous times, I pray that we would follow godly leadership. We would continue in what we have learned and how we've been taught. And that our holy, the holy scriptures, the Bible, would be our guide, and that we would seek to follow your precepts. That your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That Lord, we would be people of one book. Dismiss us now with your care and help us to let our light so shine before men. They'll see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.